All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Katie Damrat. I am the Adult Programs Coordinator at the VMFA. And today I have the pleasure of welcoming um, Alexis Assam, the Regina A. Perry Assistant Curator of Global Contemporary Art, um, to do a 3 and 30 presentation. So Alexis, I will pass it off to you. Thank you so much. So good morning, everyone, and happy Black History Month. Today, I will be talking with all of you about three works by Black artists in our 21st century galleries, and I will be highlighting these artists' work to explore the social and political landscapes evident within contemporary art. So these three works range from 1980 to 2004 and cover ideas that are extremely relevant to contemporary culture. So I just want to make a note that um, all of the work that's on view in our two 21st century galleries are not always strictly tied to being 21st century art, but more so artworks that really expand upon ideas that are important and relevant within our contemporary times. So we are going to start off um, today's presentation with this work by Julie Maritou. Um, she's an artist who was born in Ethiopia and raised in Michigan and now lives and works in New York. So the creation of her work is a real process of complexity. The work you see in front of you is the end result of many, many detailed layers. Um, and the idea for this artwork and the larger series of three paintings came from the onset of the US-led invasion of Iraq in 2003. So this series reflects on the artist's fascination with television coverage that transformed the war into a kind of video game. Um, and this series also reflects her interest in the international buildup to the 2004 Olympics in Athens. So we are kind of seeing the conflation of these two moments uh, within Stadia 3, which you see pictured in front of you, and within the larger series. Um, so it's really about the spectacle of war, um, the symbols of nationalism evident in both war and in the Olympics, and the fervor and the energy that you see on TV and you feel throughout society as a result uh, of these types of events. Um, and you can see references to these things uh, throughout the canvases. So I'm gonna bring uh, a, a couple detail images so that you can kind of see some of these symbols and examples I'm talking about. So the first really obvious and evident one is the NBC logo. And NBC is the exclusive Olympic broadcaster in the United States. So that's a real direct connection that we have here. And then obviously um, explosion, um, bombing, war, and all of the smoke and plume that comes from that. So those are two examples. Um, there are even more that are, are sprinkled and speckled throughout our painting. Um, there's a image of the outline of all of the countries on the globe. Um, there's the symbol of Islam. We also see um, banners throughout. So this is an image of Stadia 2, um, which is in the collection of the Carnegie Museum of Art. And um, you really see this symbols, the nationalism, the colors, the fanfare. Um, and also you see the stadium itself a little bit more represented in uh, part two of this series. Um, and that fervor, the bombing, the smoke is also really um, evident throughout. And then this is the first work in the series. So I wanna talk a little bit about the process that she uses. Um, so she really begins with an idea uh, and then with a primed canvas. She then creates a layer of black abstract shapes then a layer of acrylic silica that's slightly pigmented with white, and then it's applied and sanded smooth. So then when the black forms are grayed out, it creates a some sort of atmospheric space created between the ground and then the rest of the layers. And then over the course of several months, there are architectural drawings that are projected and then traced onto the canvas. And so her applications of acrylic paint and India ink are then added, upon which she inscribes the more personal writerly marks and cali cali uh, and the forms that you see um, that she refers to as characters. And they interact with architectural drawings, sometimes conflicting with the constructed environment um, and sometimes really kind of blending in. 
And so then when the work is almost finished, it's then digitally photographed. And then she adds additional forms that she projects and draws on via computer software um, and then paints them on by hand. So back to the image in our collection, Stadia 3. So as we were kind of looking at the other two works in this series, in this triptych, um, you really see the reference to Olympic fanfare. You see the reference to stadiums. And she's really bringing to light nationalism. She's bringing to light um, the fanfare around sports and global politics. But there's also an art historical example for using abstraction to depict kind of revolution and, and to depict kind of these moments within our political um, history. Um, and that's seen in the work of Russian constructivists and throughout the history of modern art. Um, and she's pulling on those histories um, here and especially in her abstracted um, elements that you see us throughout the, throughout the canvas. So the next artist that we are going to discuss is Howardina Pindell. So she was born in Philadelphia in 1943 and she grew up in the South, which was still lawfully segregated and racism was rampant and nation and, and legal nationwide. So she studied painting at Boston University and she did her MFA in painting at Yale University. And after graduating, she accepted a job at MoMA, in New York, where she worked for 12 years. Um, she worked there first as an exhibition assistant, then as an assistant curator in the Department of National and International Traveling Exhibitions, and finally as an associate curator and acting director uh, in the Department of Prints and Illustrated Books. And in 1979, she began teaching at the State University of New York, Stony Brook. Um, and this was the same time that she got into a really intense car accident that left her with partial memory loss. Um, so eight months later, which in, during which she described one of the hottest summers in New York, she set up a video camera in her apartment, focused it on herself and made free white in 21, which is the image that you see here is a detail from that video. And it is a dead pan account of the racism that she experienced coming of age as a black woman in America. And she developed the work out of her need to heal and to vent. And this is the first of Pindell's artwork to explicitly address her experiences with racism and sexism as an African-American woman and as an artist. So this image that you see of her here is a character from the video. So we have a few key works in our collection um, at the VMFA, including the video piece that I just showed you. Um, current, and we have a, this painting currently on view in our 20th century galleries, and it's her untitled work from 1973. So this stenciled painting is one of Pindell's first large scale works to include hole punch circles directly onto the surface. Um, and this was featured, and she was featured in an exhibition here at the VMFA in 2018, co-curated by Valerie Cassell Oliver and Naomi Beckwith entitled Howardina Pindell, What Remains to be Seen, which was the first survey of the artist's work. Now turning back to the video piece, um, Pindell said she was 21 when the Civil Rights Act passed in 1964. And in Free White and 21, she illustrates the stark divide between black and white Americans. The video opens with a glancing shot of the artist in white face wearing a blonde wig in the guise of a white woman from the 1950s or the 1960s. And this character is the free white and 21 year old to which she refers to in the title who appears throughout the video discounting Pindell's searing exp experiences by calling out specific racist statements. Um, this is another image from the video. And um, I'm going to have us watch the first three and a half minutes of it so that you all kind of get um, an understanding of the artist's perspective um, and what this work is really about. Oh, when my mother grew up in Ohio, her mother would bring in various babysitters. There were about 10 children in the family. And one of the babysitters happened to be white. My mother was the darkest of the 10 children, so that when this uh, woman saw my mother's skin, she thought she was dirty and took a lie and washed her in lie. 
as a result of this, my mother has burn marks on her arm. Okay. Uh, when I was in kindergarten, I had a teacher who was not very fond of black students. There were very few of us, possibly two, in the kindergarten class out of a class of perhaps 40. Uh, during the afternoon hours, we were given a time to sleep. Each of us had our own cot, and we were told that if we had to go to the bathroom, we should raise our hands, and one of the teachers would take us to the bathroom. I raised my hand, and my teacher flew into a rage, yelling, I can't stand these people, and took out sheets and tied me down to the bed. She left me there for a couple of hours and then finally released me. One of the students filed a complaint, perhaps to a parent who did not know that I was black. Perhaps the child did not know or had not learned to differentiate race at that time. I later found out that that teacher was fired for bothering a student. Perhaps I was not the first one. I went to a high school in Philadelphia, which was for girls, which emphasized academic achievement. Everyone was very competitive uh, with one another for grades. I did very well in the history classes and asked that my history teacher put me in the accelerated class. She told me she would be happy with my grades to put me in the accelerated level. However, she felt that a white student with lower grades would go further. Therefore, she would not put me in the accelerated course. You know, you really must be paranoid. Those things never happen to me. I don't know anyone who, who's had those things happen to them. But then, of course, they're free white and 21, so they wouldn't have that kind of experience. Okay, so Pendel wrote of her experience um, creating this work. She said, I decided to make Free White in 21 after yet another run-in with racism in the art world and the white feminists. Pendel describes this near-death experience of the car accident that she was in as a motivation for speaking out in her work about the things that matter most. And the racism she was experiencing was coming from every aspect of her everyday life from society, from her experiences in the art school as the only black woman in her Yale program, from her colleagues in the art world, in her roles as curator and professor. And what I find so compelling about this video piece is how relevant it still is today. Um, and the phrase free white in 21 really means beholden to no one. Um, it was based on the true story of this Video poster that you see here was based on the true story of the controversial trial of a black man accused of sexually assaulting a white woman in Dallas, Texas in 1960. And the title is a version of this uh, archaic uh, phrase, free white in 21. And it, has, it appeared in dozens of movies in the 1930s and the 1940s as a proud assertion that positioned white privilege as the ultimate argument stopper. Um, and this movie poster 
illustrates that as well um, and just shows how much uh, the phrase was a part of popular culture uh, at a time in 20th century American history. Um, and that same title is what Pindell uses to really impersonate this white character and, and show how she is positioning her privilege to essentially tell Pindell that her experiences are not valid. Um, and it's a really, um, you know, shocking thing to see. And it's more so shocking how relevant her sentiments from 1980 still are here with us today in 2023. So the next artist we're going to discuss is Ronald Lockett. He was born and raised in Bessemer, Alabama, and he turned his attention to art making full time in his early 20s. Um, his elder cousin, the artist Thornton Dial, mentored and encouraged him. And by the time of Lockett's death at age 32 from HIV AIDS related pneumonia, he had produced more than 350 works. Um, that were largely unrecognized in his lifetime. Um, this piece that you see here, Fever Within, was a direct result uh, of the artist grappling with his diagnosis, and he made around six versions of this artwork. Um, I just wanted to show a little detail of the inferior man that proved Hitler wrong. Um, it is an homage to Jesse Owens that suggests the pent up energy of an era in history the black freedom struggle. It is about to, the character that you see here is really about to spring into full stride. Um, and if you look in the center, you kind of see a, a circular image here, which is the top of uh, the figure's head, of Jesse Owens' head. And he's kind of crouched down uh, at the starting blocks about to start his race. So the starting position of a runner is what Lockett is illustrating here. Um, doing so with these found materials, found tin um, to, to illustrate the figure. Um, so I'm sure you all know the story. At the Berlin 1936 Olympic Games, against the backdrop of racial discrimination in Nazi Germany, uh, Jesse Owens won four gold medals, um, which is a record that he kept for 50 years after. Um, he won gold in the 100 meter dash, the long jump, and the 200 meter dash, um, setting a true Olympic record. Um, and this work really celebrates his unparalleled athleticism and determination in the face of great adversity. So all of the artists whose work that I've discussed today um, really touch on different social and political moments, starting with war and corporate propaganda, Meritu's painting, racism and misogyny are evident in the work of Howardina Pindell, as well as the racism highlighted in the subject matter of Lockett's work. And all of these artists bring these issues to light um, in the works that we saw today, but also as a through line throughout the artwork that they have created and continue to create. Um, and it really allows for a spark of interest further research and important conversations um, that really make an impact on our understanding and contemporary culture and processing the world around us. So thank you all for attending today. Thank you so much, Alexis. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye.